I agree with that. And also maybe on a more simple way, um, just keep track of the natural life cycle, what's happening here at Ali. Uh, when the first birds returned, when the first Katie did sing, as, as Henry uh, Thoreau said, especially you, you young people who are interested in writing, uh, said you have to see before you can say, and also I think he got that from Gilbert White, and he, he wrote it. So uh, just be aware of where you are, you know, the soil, and when you're in the garden, taste the soil. Uh, just a little bit on your finger, uh, to taste its, you know, the acidity of it. Don't eat the earthworm, but uh, uh, <laughs> watch the trees. You know, when the dogwoods bloom, uh, when the first, uh, I don't, you, I'm sure that you have, uh, you have hepatica here in the hilllands, and when the hepaticas bloom, it can vary up to two weeks, and it is watch the season. Be just, of course, I've lived on the same place all my life, so it's easy for me to say. Let's keep a bird list. Hmm. Uh, when the first, you know, uh, out with your vernal pools, you know, the spring peepers and the wood frogs, you know, when they call, and the wood frogs especially, just for a day or two, there's still ice on the ponds, and they make this prehistoric sound. And then they all quit, and they all start again. Walk out and listen. Also when they have any <laughs> <laughs> Um, there was one related to that for Brian. Where is the best place on Captina Creek to listen? To, to listen to the land. To listen to the land? Wow, there's a bunch of them. Um, I don't know. Um, I guess it depends on what you want to hear. <laughs> uh, um, I, the land can speak in several different ways. I mean, whether it's like, you know, the wind just rustling through the trees on one of the ridge tops, like Clover Ridge, or uh, I don't know, Pew Ridge, or or like if you if you like the sound of water, like the riffles that are right east of Armstrong Mills are, are comforting, or like, I don't know, I mean, Pretty much wherever you go in Captina, you're going to encounter some sort of wildlife, no matter what season it is. If even in the dead of winter, you know there are still species of birds that that you can go out and listen to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. My list is extensive <laughs> for for places to go on Captina Creek to be to to you know become in touch with nature. But um, you know, those are those are three places that just kind of come right off the top of my head um, as, as being my favorites in the watershed. Thank you. Um, Carrie, would Warren Wilson be willing to allow only French school students to work internships over the summer? Ooh, that's a good question. We actually have a large number of students, about 100 to 115 that keep the s school running. Uh, we have a lot, um, a lot of students that work on the farm. We still give tours. We have a big musical gathering called the Swananoa Gathering, which some of you may have heard of. Um, but I think that's definitely something that we could work out. We have some dorms by the chapel, um, in addition to the regular dorms, but they're just a little nicer. So only students might want to stay there. Um, but absolutely, yeah, we love having guests on campus and especially guests that want to work and learn and give us their feedback and their ideas too, absolutely. Thank you. David and Elsie, how and where did you get the funding to start Farming Magazine? We got $20,000 from a grant. Well, yes, a grant. Somebody gave our county a million dollars, some anonymous person for stipulated earmark for vocational training beyond the eighth grade. And it had to go to a nonprofit or to a church. Well, we qualified as a church. I was the bishop. <laughs> 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 and they gave us $20,000 to start. That got the first issue out free. We, how we printed 5,000 issues, the advertising was free, and that got, a, and that got us going. And it was a little bit for the uh, uh, enough left over for the next issue, but from their own, it's been self-supporting. Uh, it's it's not. Uh, we have just now uh, taken on board uh, a young man who does. Uh, you know, we have a local Amish manufacturer of plows and harrows called Pioneer Equipment, 
and they thought they had sort of maxed out, and they hired this young man three years ago, you know, designed their catalog and helped their promotion, and they were far from maxed out. So this, uh, they suggested, Wayne Wanger, that this young man help us, and he's just giving us ideas. We'll do a little bit of a facelift now after, after 10 years. Uh, there'll be a few changes, N nothing major. Want to keep the center clean. We, uh, it was designed by readers. We want one thing: we want a page number on every page. We don't, uh, and we don't want to continue stories if at all possible. It's all in one stretch. So to make easy reading, have a lot of white space. But we could use a lot of help. So we we got that twenty thousand. It's from the Homes County Education, but it was not given. It was not government money. It was from a private person. They felt this is. Uh, uh, they consider it one of their really useful grants that they've given. I think it's covered. <laughs> um, there are many, many questions here about mining of different kinds and its effect on the environment. Um, so I just wondered if, if you could address some of the problems that arise with coal mining and hydrofracking and, and what happens to wildlife and we use, the more we use electricity for technology, why? What happens to the environment around us? <laughs> Would you like to begin? <laughs> so, um, so Do you want a more specific question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's very broad. And <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. um, what is the effect of coal mining on Captina Creek? Um, to say that it doesn't have an effect is a lie, but um, uh, the effects, th th there's definitely an effect. Uh, I think the, the, the mine in recent years has become much more aware and responsive to that, to that effect. Um, and they're, they're now willing to work with different organizations uh, through mitigation projects um, to kind of offset some of the negative effects uh, of the coal mine. Um, but the, the coal mine is what it is. I mean, if it wasn't for demand for the coal, the mine wouldn't be there in existence. Uh, it's there to make money, and that money comes from coal that powers electricity in, in our homes and businesses. So, it, I mean, you can go ahead and blame the mine, like for the recent slurry spill or prior slurry spills. But I kind of had this this uh, when I when I was down there in the creek surveying the damage the week that the or the weekend after the most recent slurry spill. I kind of like was just standing in the creek in this in the impact zone, listening to these vacuum trucks and listening to like you know these machines sucking up rocks the size of grapefruits out of the creek bed and and it, it kind of hit me that what that this is the price that that we pay for our lifestyle you know the the price isn't paid in dollars and cents on your AEP electric bill or whatever the price is paid you know at ground zero when a disaster like this or like the gulf oil spill happens and it, it it really just it dawned on me and, and kind of made me think you know twice about some of the decisions that I make personally and in, in my lifestyle to, to you, you know is it is it really worth it is is it really worth that impact and it, and you know it's not just with me it's it's with everybody you know I think if you're going to make whole scale change environmental change you, you know. It, it, it can't just be with one person or one little group of people. It has to kind of be an over, a, a, a totally encompassing sweeping change in, a, a, in a America. Um, and I, I don't have answers to how that, that change can come about, but it starts with, with lifestyle, in my opinion. Um, this is a, a question relating to that, and I think it can be, um, have at it, any of you can answer this. Um, using or reducing technology seems like a lifestyle choice. How can reducing technology in one's life be implemented, implemented on an institutional level where technology becomes more and more ubiquitous in recruitment and admissions, as well as 
academics. Is such a reduction sustainable? Well, I, I will say one thing. I was impressed that we didn't eat off paper plates at noon. <laughs> Styrofoam plates. Styrofoam plates. The, my, Children used to laugh at me, you know, when I say that you don't do this and you don't do that because you fill the landfill. But, you know, big things have to start with small things. So if you don't use paper plates in your home and you raise your food, that sends a message to your children and they're going to do that in their families. So it puts a lot of responsibility on every one of us. And I could add a little bit with on on the institutional level. We have many Amish manufacturers that are in in a huge way and don't use electricity from the wire. So you know it's possible. But I'm not saying it's for you. It, to me, it would look almost impossible to make a large switch to non electricity like like we're living. But it's not a hard life at all. It, we, we are. You can see I'm I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so as to say, he, he's on good pasture. So. Uh, and uh, I'd like to add, li add one thing on watersheds. Was so interesting, you know, what Brian said here is that uh, some of the decisions made by the Amish Church have long-term effects. You know, we're constantly working with technology, and one decision that the Lancaster Amish made. I'm not saying this in a negative way at all. They chose not to go with the skid steer loader. You know, the bobcats that you see that many farmers use, and it's the most useful tool on a small farm that's you know, moving round bales, hauling manure, picking apples. You can use them anywhere. And, of course, as their land prices increase, they have to increase their cow numbers. And then when they increase, they went to liquid manure, and then they filled a lot of silos. They had corn stalk, and they put the liquid manure on the corn stalk, and in a hard rain, it goes in the Chesapeake Bay. And that's what's degradating the bay. Is basically part of it was a decision by the church. And that's interesting to me. Holmes County decided to go with a skid steer. So we haul solid manure mixed with a, a, a with carbon, a straw, corn stover, sawdust, whatever, but it's it's staple. And so we, we don't have that problem. It's very you know, watersheds are very, very interesting. because uh, all the you know, some you know, I always get this this excitement of seeing a farm where uh, I have a friend who lives in northern Ohio. Half of his farm goes into Lake Erie and the other half into the High River. It's right on the divide of the water. So, uh, I, mean. I have a quick response to the admission part. Um, in this day and age, it's amazing. We can fly around the country and we can drive and we can take the train. I, but I think one of the most simple and effective um, recruiting tools in our office is for me to get on the telephone and just talk to people one-on-one -on -one once they've heard about Warren Wilson instead of spending the big bucks to advertise and to stay in hotels and rent cars and eat out. Um, and, and I think we're all trying to make small changes on campus. I, um, about four years ago I chose to move back onto campus so that means I can walk to school um, as most of you know how nice that is and I can walk to the trails and, and we have garden markets twice a week on campus which is really nice so I can get some fresh produce and I can get some meat from the farm and some eggs which is really nice too so I think just little changes and then when I do go on the road um, it's amazing how many people maybe have recycling programs even in hotels or in little places but you have to ask to find out so don't be shy in asking people if there's a place where you can recycle a bottle or recycle paper. And I know these are really simple answers, but sometimes you have to start out small with folks before you can get to really move on to the big problems. Thank you. Um, if we can stay on the ideal of college for a second. As a working college, what type of tuition structure does Warren Wilson have? And there was another question that asked if students were paid for the work that they do on the farm. Yeah, we actually get a federally funded grant. So a student gets $3,480 reduced off the cost of their room and board each year. And I don't know if that's complimentary to Sterling, um, but I can tell you this, if a student ends up not working, they can be fired from a crew. Um, if they end up not doing their hours, they will owe the school money. Um, and unlike Berea, and Alice Lloyd, where most or all of the tuition and room and board is paid for the students, we actually charge about $31,400 a year. And I tell my students, that's room